Hello and welcome to the CSF Rheumatology Author Interview Podcast. My name is Professor Peter Nash from the Griffith University in beautiful downtown Brisbane. And today we are very, very fortunate to be joined by my good friend and colleague, Professor Joseph Smolin from the Medical University in Vienna in Austria. Uh, welcome, Joseph, and thank you so much for giving up your time. Um, Joseph not only is the editor of Annals Rheumatic Diseases, not only a former president of ULA, but I can think of very few other people that have changed the face of rheumatology like Joseph has, with major innovations, treat to target, the universal use of C-dye, DAPS or other metrics. Um, his contribution is not only um, greatly appreciated, is really an unbelievable contribution to the field. So welcome, Joseph. Today, we are going to be talking about a recently published paper of yours, in the Journal of Rheumatology, and it's talking about the efficacy of baricitinib in patients with moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis over a three-year time period, a long-term safety study. So before we get into it, can you just tell us a little bit about how the COVID situation is in Vienna and Austria at the moment, and how it's affected your practice? Well, the COVID situation in Austria has uh, initially been excellent and uh, it has really been uh, uh, controlled well with a very early lockdown. And uh, over the summer, uh, it has uh, also been very fortunate in that uh, we uh, have uh, not really uh, been immersed into major difficulties in the hospitals. And so uh, from that perspective, I must say that we have enjoyed summer vacation in Carinthia uh, and, uh, and have really uh, been able to see our grandchildren uh, who partly live in Germany. So the ones that were outside the country for the very first time since uh, the winter but uh, after the, uh, the uh, summer holidays, the situation came actually out of control. I'm not sure that the government has done the best thing in not shutting down the country early. We are now in the third lockdown. So I guess if they had done this around mid-October when, uh, when uh, the uh, numbers of infected people creeped up a lot, uh, that we would have then uh, uh, really uh, been in a better situation than now. So by now we have almost 6,000 deaths uh, in the country, which for a small country of close to 9 million is quite a lot. And I think that would have been preventable. But you know, this is uh, the situation and currently we're coming down with the numbers again. And uh, on Sunday, the first uh, uh, persons here in the country were vaccinated. So we hope that uh, with the vaccine, we will be able to really um, get into a new normality uh, in the sense of the old normality, hopefully. And uh, being able to travel to Australia, for example, <laughs> uh, or travel to meetings uh, uh, would be a, a wonderful change from what we've seen this year. Now, all the conferences, as you know, were, were virtual. Uh, and uh, I, my understanding is that even ULAR 2021 will still be virtual, uh, but thereafter, I guess we will have uh, normality in this respect. Now, how did practice change? Probably not uh, dissimilar to the practice changes in other parts of the world. Uh, patients had less access to care uh, in the sense that uh, they couldn't come as uh, they wanted to come, but. Uh, uh, had to go through major controls and uh, there was a lot of telephone interactions uh, and uh, at the time when the lockdown was uh, was uh, uh, not complete obviously the situation became better uh, currently the intensive care units are pretty full uh, currently the hospital beds are pretty full uh, but uh, for our patients we always have room if if they really need it my understanding from what we published in the uh, Annals of the Rheumatic Diseases, however, I must say is that in many regions, such as in Italy, uh, 
patients, for example, with more serious diseases, such as the giant cell arthritis and similar, came to clinical care later than yeah. they came in previous years. And thus, for example, in Italy, uh, there were more uh, first presentations of giant cell arthritis already with ocular problems uh, than there was ever before. So yes, practice has changed, but uh, in general, uh, we we get through the crisis uh, pretty well, I guess. Hope for yes. you the same. Same. Uh, did you have a lot of issue with patients stopping their medication or wanting to stop their medication? Uh, the patients asked if they should stop the medications. Uh, but uh, but it wasn't really a problem because uh, if one explained to them how important it was not to not to have active disease, uh, then it uh, it obviously uh, became uh, quite clear to them uh, that uh, they should continue their medication. Uh, and uh, at some point in time, we all learned that. The drugs uh, that uh, we use in the field, uh, such as the biologic agents, uh, that they were not a real problem for more severe disease or even contracting disease uh, more frequently, uh, so that uh, we could really tell the patients with good faith to keep the medication and obviously uh, we kept the glucocorticoids down as much uh, as, uh, as we could. Uh, at, but in general, uh, I think that we came through the situation quite well. Uh, and the patients really adhered uh, to the medications. But overall, as I said, uh, we have uh, difficult times this year. Uh, and, uh, and I guess that... Uh, uh, we can only hope for better times uh, also for the patients and especially uh, for the fact that uh, they uh, will hopefully all get vaccinated at some point. I don't know if in your country uh, there is a lot of, uh, of um, uh, skepticism about vaccination. Here, uh, probably only 30% of the population said that they really wanted the vaccine, uh, another 30% said that they want to wait uh, and 40 percent about 40 percent uh, uh, do not want to take uh, the vaccine at all yes so i think it, that's a major issue everywhere now and your vaccine program's underway i thought the eula guidance was very helpful in the setting of covid and how to handle it at a rheumatology yeah. level yeah and uh, and there is a guidance document also coming out if it didn't come out already uh, regarding uh, uh, the um, vaccination situation. Because again, uh, obviously, uh, patients fear side effects, but we don't need to fear side effects because the drugs that we use, they don't increase the risk of getting a side effect from a vaccination. The only thing that they may do is they may decrease the propensity of the body to produce sufficient protection. So yes, we will then have to check, for example, titers if the patients have, have protective titers as soon as we know about protective titers for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Uh, yes. but, uh, but it's not a risk that they get, it's not a live vaccine. And even with the live vaccine, it's not so clear how dangerous there are because there have been inadvertent vaccinations with yellow fever vaccines in many patients uh, who, uh, who took uh, uh, biologic agents, uh, and to my knowledge, there was no major incident there. Uh, and uh, from that perspective, I guess that uh, we can, at least for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, be pretty safe and, and be clear about that in, uh, uh, in, um, in, 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 in the times to come now for uh, the era of uh, vaccination uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I think this is a big advance. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, one of the persons who developed the, uh, the BioNTech uh, vaccine uh, is, is a colleague of mine who I know for 30, 40 years, and, and he has founded, uh, co-founded that, uh, uh, that um, company 
uh, in Mainz, he was professor of, of, um, of uh, medicine. He's an immunologist by training, but he was professor of medicine uh, at the Mainz University in Germany. Uh, and he then with some others founded this biotech company focusing on, on RNA vaccination. And it's a record time that they, that they developed this uh, together with Pfizer. Uh, and I think this is very rewarding to see how from many, many sites, people within very short term have been able uh, to really uh, bring us to a situation where a potentially deadly, at least life-threatening disease is controlled within short. I don't think we've ever had this in the history of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of pandemics, of the history of infectious diseases to get the vaccination that no, fast. Yeah. I don't, I think I'm not aware of that uh, up to now. I think that's a Nobel Prize just sitting there waiting to happen, I suspect, over time. Well, you know, this is a very good point. I mean, I think it deserves, uh, it deserves certainly uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, major, major awards and rewards. And uh, one of the rewards, obviously, for all of them is that the drug is being used worldwide and, and is hopefully going to, to be protective for the world. Now, the only thing that I'm worrying about is uh, the fact that it might not so be not so easy for people in less affluent countries, such as in Africa or in Asia or in South America, uh, to get to the vaccine, uh, not only for the price, but also to deliver the vaccine to the places where it's needed. So I hope that uh, the logistics will be there and with the help of, uh, of the companies and of, of foundations like the Bill Gates and similar foundations, uh, we will be able to bring this also to the poor. Uh, and not only to the affluent countries, and, and the sooner the better. Yes, I think you're 100% correct. The, the economic repercussions are going to be like a tidal wave. Um, okay, so let's, thank you so much. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your paper. And, and first, can you give us a feel for how the jacks have penetrated the Austrian market and how they're being used? And uh, the EMEA has approved for Gottlieb, which the US have uh, given them a um, complete response letter and just about killed it. What's happening with JACs in Europe and in, in Austria? Um, how are they penetrating the market and how are they being used over there? Well, in principle, the JACs are a new class of drugs. Yes. It, it is fantastic to see that before the year 2000, we had the old drugs, the conventional synthetic DMARDs. They were very good. Uh, Sulfasalazine works, methotrexate works phenomenally, especially in combination with glucocorticoids. And, and as you know, uh, uh, the Scandinavian group has just published the Nord Stream. Uh, the North, is it North Stream trial? North Star, sorry, North Star, uh, North Star trial, where they showed that methotrexate plus glucocorticoids in early disease uh, is, is not topped by three biologics plus methotrexate, certolizumab, tozilizumab, uh, and, and abatase. So, yes, it has its place, but not everyone responds. Then, from the 2000s on in the world, approved maybe a year before, uh, we had the biologic DMARD revolution, which actually the biologics were spearheaded by the rheumatologists and, and many other specialties embarked on that later on. And then there was very little going on in the last decade, because from 2009, 2010 onward, for many years, we had no new drug approved. Before we had TNF blockers, we had tozilizumab, we had rituximab, we had abatase. So within a decade or less, we had a number of agents that were approved and all of them had their place and all of them were highly effective. And then all of a sudden from 2010 onward, nothing happened. Until the second half of the last decade, when the JAK inhibitors the first one was tofacitinib in, in rheumatology to be approved when the JAK inhibitors appeared on the market. 
And that was, again, a small revolution because the JAK inhibitors can be taken orally. They need to penetrate the cell membrane and they don't, they don't target molecules uh, in solution in, in the blood uh, or on the cell surface, but they target intracellular mechanisms. And so that was, a, again, a total change, essentially in some way back to the small molecules that we had before, but now, in contrast to those molecules, because even for methotrexate, we don't really know the mode of action until today, now with a real target, and indeed these, these drugs were developed to target those intracellular molecules of signal transduction. So that in, in principle is already a major change in the thinking, a, a major change in, in, in the, the evolution of the therapies for various rheumatic diseases. And as we know, the JAK inhibitors are not only efficacious for rheumatoid arthritis, but they are also uh, efficacious for psoriatic arthritis. They may be and are efficacious for axial spondyloarthritis. They may be efficacious for, for other diseases such as lupus. They appear to be efficacious, at least some of them, uh, for psoriasis. Uh, so again, for, for, for inflammatory bowel diseases. So again, just like TNF blockers before, they, they are, they, they are uh, drugs that may and will be used in a variety of diseases, which is nice and is good uh, uh, for medicine in, in, in principle. So the first patients that we used JAK inhibitors in were obviously those who had failed other drugs. Now, that's clear. The first time we used tozilizumab was in patients who had failed several TNF blockers. The first time we used rituximab, and that's actually its main approval, is in patients who have failed TNF blockers. So yes, every new drug gets tested by the community at first in those patients who have nothing else left over because they are new and we don't know whether they will work well, which side effects they have. And so so this, this is what it was going on in the beginning uh, with uh, the JAK inhibitors. And bear in mind that in Europe, tofacitinib was not immediately approved as it was in the United States, but it took a few years until it was approved. And indeed, if I recall correctly, baricitinib was even approved slightly a, a few weeks or whatever before tofacitinib in Europe. Now, meanwhile, we have upadacitinib approved and we have filgotinib approved. So just, just like with the TNF blockers, we have now several, several JAK inhibitors that are used and can be used in Europe. The Japanese have pepicitinib in addition to that. Uh, and currently uh, there are clinical trials going on with the TIC2 inhibitor. So, so we, we will further expand in this area. Yes, I also feel that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a little bit of a shame uh, that filgotinib was not approved in the United States. We also know that baricitinib was only improved in the US at, uh, at uh, 200, mm -hmm. at, at two milligram. Uh, filgotinib was approved, but only at the 100 milligram dose. Uh, uh, so so I, I guess that uh, we will see a, a little bit more over the next years. Uh, in Europe, we have, for all these drugs, the dose that worked best and where we did not have the impression, at least this, as, as clinical scientists, that the adverse event profile was different from the smaller medication. It reminds me a little bit of the tocilizumab story uh, where in the United States, uh, the, the use was limited initially oh, at no. least to, to four milligrams uh, for, this, uh, per, for the IV drug, uh, four milligrams uh, per kilogram, which I never understood and no one else understood. To me, it was even the slightly less safe a drug because to my recollection, there were a little bit more um, anaphylactoid reactions with the lower dose than with the higher dose. So, yes. so yes, this is it. But in Europe, we can use these drugs. Uh, the, the exact price is not known to me. This is something between the payers and the, uh, and the, uh, the companies. Uh, but uh, given the fact that uh, we have so many biosimilars now, 
uh, I would assume that the price of these drugs is not horrendously higher because otherwise they, they would not be reimbursed. Uh, and they are reimbursed under certain circumstances. The present time, yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. mostly and reimbursed yeah. after a biologic has failed. Uh, okay. This is the reimbursed any, any, story, and that's not unclear. Yeah, yeah. Any field for market share, are they 30%, 20%? What kind oh, they're, of they are they are they are less less than that, but they but they have a place there. They have okay. a place there. All right. So that's why one of these studies that uh, looks at long term, mainly safety, but also efficacy, is so important. So could you tell us a little bit about this study and what the idea behind it was? Well, for every drug that is new on the market, that is newly approved, we need to have long term data. We need to have data regarding their continued efficacy, but especially data regarding their continued safety. And this is not only true and was not only true for the biologic agents, but it's obviously true also for the JAK inhibitors. Now, to be honest, I have never seen a drug that was efficacious for six months or 12 months, not to continue being efficacious as long as it wasn't stopped for, I don't know what, adverse events. At the same time, I must admit that I have, I'm, I do not recall, but maybe you will remind me of something, I do not recall that we saw over the years adverse events in the long term that haven't been seen early on. This reminds me of a paper that Daniel Aritaha and I published maybe 20 years ago or 15 years ago, where in his thesis, he looked at the evolution of adverse events with conventional synthetic DMARDs, because this was the days uh, where, where, where biologics had just come in and we were interested on, on how, how to better use the conventional synthetic DMARDs. And it turned out that even for methotrexate, if you did not have a side effect within the first three months, you usually did not get it subsequently, unless the dose was changed, unless uh, the patient's situation changed in the sense that, it, I don't know what, some, some renal function or whatever changed, but if the overall situation of the patient was stable, you saw the adverse event profile already within the first three months of giving the drug. So you saw the, the, the liver enzyme increases, you saw uh, the cytopenias, you saw whatever you wanted to see, or you could see, you usually saw in the first three months and didn't see it later on. That's a paper that we published in the, in the early uh, 2000s. And I think that this is also true for our current medications. It was true for the biologics. I do not recall that any one of them had an, a safety issue a year or two or three after having started the drug. Yes. And it seems to be that. the same for this class of drugs for, for, the, uh, uh, for the, the, the... Because even the unexpected situation with the JAK inhibitors and, and, and actually the regulator saw this because you and I didn't see it from the clinical trials shining up because of the rarity of the events. Even the situation with the venous thromboembolic events occurred early. And indeed yeah. with baricitinib, it wasn't even seen in the long term. It was yeah. only seen early as an imbalance. Yeah. And it wasn't even seen when patients sw swapped over from placebo to active medication, it wasn't seen. So I, I don't fully understand that situation, but it is clear that there is a signal. There is a signal for tofacitinib in cardiovascular risk patients, as we just addressed in the paper that the two of us published and, and, uh, and, and organized with respect to the consensus statement on the use of JAK inhibitors. And so from that perspective, the, the paper that we published in rheumatology uh, recently shows the same. Efficacy is essentially maintained and yeah. there is no new safety 
issues. Interesting you said that. Three years. Because lots of rheumatologists always say, I need more data, I need more follow-up. And now you've got TOE for 10-year follow-up, you've got Barry eight years, you've got U for three, you've got Philgo. So I, I hear what you're saying. So did you have lots of discontinuation? That's the only issue that might affect this efficacy. People doing well continue to do well. People not doing well have dropped out long ago. So if the discontinuation... No, I, I, we, we, did not, we did not have many discontinuations unless the drug didn't work. I mean, yeah. uh, we, we strive today for remission in, 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 in patients with extensive and, and long-standing disease for at least low disease activity. Uh, and we know exactly that only half, even in clinical trials, only half of the patients can reach that low yeah. disease activity and even less can reach remission. Uh, so yes, there are discontinuations in those in whom it doesn't work, but you see that within short term, you see that within three months. Yeah. And for us, at least, when patients fail one, they may still respond to another one of the same class. And this is not uh, dissimilar from what we have seen with biological DMARDs, where patients who fail PNF inhibitors would still respond to a smaller extent than originally, but still respond uh, to another TNF blocker. And this is also what the EULA recommendations say. And the EULA recommendations, although we do not have data on patients who fail a JAK inhibitor and receive a second one, uh, we assume that this will not be dissimilar from what we saw uh, regarding PNF blockers. We also saw it for sarilumab after tocilizumab failed. Uh, and indeed, probably in rheumatology, or at least in rheumatoid arthritis, the, the major action of the JAK inhibitors is to interfere with the IL-6 signal transduction. Uh, and there is no major difference between patients who failed uh, an IL-6 receptor blocker uh, compared with patients who failed the TNF blocker in terms of their responsiveness uh, to a subsequent check inhibitor like baricitinib. So we did not see uh, this uh, uh, in the study that Mark Cimarese published uh, RAD clinic. So efficacy was nice, few discontinuations, um, the kind of responses that you'd expect to see with an active drug anything safety that was different to what we saw in the early trials. We should comment on Zoster, your take on the VTE issue. Is this a JAK class or is it perhaps a JAK2 issue uh, if it's known? And maybe even some of the rarer things, gastric perf and neutropenia. Yeah. So ob obviously, obviously uh, the uh, zoster, herpes zoster is, is twice to three times more frequently observed compared with biologic DMARDs. However, this is the case, especially in Asia, especially in Japan and Korea. It's not uh, seen to the same extent uh, in Europe. Uh, or, or uh, in the Americas. With respect to the VTEs, uh, we have seen recent data regarding uh, the, the uh, group of patients who were at high risk of cardiovascular events. There, tofacitinib was studied in the unlicensed dose of 10 milligram twice daily and that showed a six-fold increase in pulmonary embolism, which was statistically significant, compared to TNF blockers, because the control, and they have an active control, there is TNF blockers. But there was also a dose response, because the five milligram BID was in between the TNF blockers and, uh, and uh, the 10 milligram BID, and while for venous thromboembolic events that are not pulmonary embolism, uh, there was no significant difference between the various arms, there was again a trend that suggested the dose response. By the way, this study isn't finished yet, so we don't have conclusive data. However, the 10 milligram BRD dose was discontinued to my recollection, and the Current data, as far as they are available, with the caveat that the study is not finalized, have very recently been published, I believe in November, uh, in the Annals of the Rheumatic Diseases in a, in a paper on tofacitinib uh, uh, 
that was first authored by Phil Meese. So everyone can look at that and can see all, all these data. But these are the two most remarkable things, herpes zoster uh, on the one hand and potential VTE, whereby VTE appears to be primarily a problem in patients at risk. Very high body mass in this history of VTEs, uh, high cardiovascular risk factors, uh, use of COX-2 inhibitors apparently is also a, a risk factor and, and some others. So, uh, so this is an issue that needs to be carefully observed, but we must be aware of the fact that it is rare. However, the warning is there in particular for patients. Uh, by the way, another risk factor is high age. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we must be aware of these issues and, and weigh the use of every drug with respect to the risk profile of the patient uh, and uh, uh, with uh, respect to the patient's past uh, medical history. And this is what we actually address in, in the consensus statement, which uh, uh, has just come out in the annals in, in the January issue, which is already out, even though it's not yet in January. <laughs> and do you have Shindrix available in uh, Austria? Is it available? Not yet. In... Not yet. Not so yet. we have the same. We have Zostavax, which is really pretty disappointing in its efficacy. So. So now, the one thing that I should say is that I've seen also recently a patient who got a second time Zoster on, on a JET inhibitor. So uh, we, we know that Zoster can recur. We know that it's not always a once in, in your lifetime disease, uh, but, but obviously that's unpleasant for the patients. If this is a, a recurrence Zoster in, infection, uh, that's 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 not very pleasant for the patient. That's that's fine. So good efficacy, um, safety, no new signal that stand out. Anything about any sort of take home message for the uh, rheumatologists from the study? Um, it was it was a nice study. They had some patients on methotrexate to look at, some patients that lumumab, some placebo patients to balance out some of those risks and benefits. It has nice tables looking at the different. Um, impacts of the, uh, the, the how often these things happen. So what should the rheumatologist take home from this study with baricitinib in particular over three years in a clinical trial situation? Well, that the drug is efficacious also in the long term and that there were no new adverse events seen, which is the most important thing of the long-term extension. Is there anything rare that we missed in the first six months that may come up over time. And that's not the case. This is exactly what we discussed before, uh, that usually the adverse events come up early. Still, I, be I personally believe that we need to look at that because we never know whether it could be one new drug that, that gets some long-term accumulation of problems. Uh, but this does not appear to be the case for the JAK inhibitors, uh, as it was not the case for uh, the biologic demands. Was the TAPER study included in this particular paper? Can you recall if... Um, I think TAPER is interesting if you can recapture those rare people that flare. Do, do you recall if the well, that, that was in a different paper. Uh, and and uh, in principle, you can recapture in about 80 to 90 percent of the patients. But the remarkable thing about those reduction, which we all try to do anyway, and you know every patient asks you about that, and and the foremost drug that patients wants to want to reduce is methotrexate, for example. Uh, and and so it's it's true for every drug. Do I have to take it lifelong? Do I have to take it uh, at the same dose for the whole time? Now, the, the most remarkable thing in my view was that two thirds of the patients, more than two thirds of the patients could reduce their baricitinib dose from four to two milligrams without the flare. And I think that this is uh, uh, also rewarding. And we need to bear in mind that also in this dose reduction study, something that we observed some time ago with uh, dose reduction with TN TNF blockers is that the deeper your remission, the less likely is your flare. In other words, in this study, 
we stopped or we reduced those in low in, in sustained low disease activity. But sustained low disease activity is not remission. And and why not significant? There was a trend for those patients who were in stringent remission, CDI remission, to not have recurrence of disease, to not lose their remission as frequently as patients who were in low disease activity and stopped. So residual activity tells you that there is residual activity. Uh, and and uh, no activity suggests to you that you have really dampened the disease to, to zero activity. And then it is, uh, and that's what Eula recommends it's in its recommendations, to really start tapering biologics in patients who have reached sustained remission, not in patients who have reached sustained low disease activity with residual, uh, with residual uh, joint counts or, or, or swollen joints or symptoms. I was going to ask in our country, it's our practice to start combination for at least the first 12 weeks. And then given that methotrexate hasn't been controlling the disease prior, we might think about tapering that a little. Are you, do you aim for monotherapy or do you prefer combination even if it's low dose methotrexate? I always prefer combination. I might reduce the methotrexate dose, but I usually do not stop it. We have seen enough uh, situations where stopping methotrexate was followed by more flares. Uh, there has been a recent uh, study from the Netherlands that showed uh, that when you uh, compare in a randomized way, reducing or, or stopping a TNF blocker versus stopping methotrexate, there was no difference in the overall outcome. And uh, what Eula recommends uh, is to keep the methotrexate if the patients tolerated it. What, what the heck? Uh, there is absolutely, absolutely convincing evidence that the combination is better than the monotherapy on all accounts. For all drugs that I've seen up to now, not always maximally, but even for baricitinib, in the early RA trial of baricitinib, RA begin, uh, the, the monotherapy was very good in clinical and functional terms, but it was not different from methotrexate in structural terms, whereas the combination of methotrexate plus baricitinib uh, had a significantly lower progression of joint damage compared with methotrexate. So even in these situations where it seems that the monotherapy is, is, is very good, there is an advantage of the combination. Having said that, there are many people who don't tolerate methotrexate and then they have plutonamide allergy. So then, uh, then the drugs of choice would be a drug that inhibits uh, the IL-6 receptor or a drug that inhibits uh, uh, the JAK inhibitors, uh, the, the, the genus kinases. So I think that this is clear. This is also what Euler says. If you cannot tolerate any of the biologic, uh, of the conventional synthetic DMARC, then these agents have an advantage as a monotherapy compared with other agents. There's no doubt because we know from uh, uh, the studies on sarilumab and on tocilizumab that in a monotherapy, they are clearly superior on all accounts, including CDI remission. They're clearly superior uh, to, uh, to adalimumab or, or presumably also other TNF blockers. Having said that, I think it is important to point out that when you use these agents, you should not use a, a, a score that includes an acute phase reactant such as the DAS28, because that may give you an impression of a score remission, which isn't necessarily a clinical remission. And that's why we use the CDI uh, throughout, because that gives you not only a possibility to follow the patients from the beginning to the end, but also a stringent remission criteria acknowledged by the ACR and ULA remission task force uh, and, uh, and uh, allows you to, to really get to a point where you have no differences in terms of the quality of your outcome between one drug uh, such as a TNF blocker or a methotrexate and another drug that interferes directly with the acute phase response such as the six receptor blockers or jacket inhibitors. Superb. So thank you very much again for your time, Joseph. We greatly appreciate it. Um, 
This has been the CSF Author Interview Podcast. If you'd like to know more about this paper and others uploaded to the CSF website this month, you can get detailed slide sets available in the publication section at cytokinesignaling.com. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from and let us know what you think. Give us some feedback. We greatly appreciate your time. We wish you a, a very happy new year to you and your family. And, and we hope to you and your year. family. And next bye year bye. will be a little, little bit more normal. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.